All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tony Arciero. I'm an assistant professor in the psychology department, and I teach leadership in organizations here at VMI. Our next speaker is Robert Forsman. He's the local health agency coordinator for the Roanoke City Allegheny Health District for the Virginia Department of Health. He was working there when the COVID crisis hit. Prior to working at the Virginia Department of Health, he served as a senior emergency management specialist for the County of Hen Henrico from 2017 to 2020, and the emergency management coordinator for Rockbridge County from 2006 to 2017. He's a graduate of Lexington High School and a member of the 1983 class of Virginia Military Institute. He received his bachelor's in education from Bluefield College and a master's in educational leadership in 1994 from Virginia Tech. Robert began his career in education, working both as a teacher and an administrator in public schools before leaving in 2006 for a position with Rockbridge County. So, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Forsman. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I've done a lot of stuff, and apparent, that's apparent because I'm not very good at keeping jobs. Um, I want this to be a conversation. I want it to be informal. I'm going to talk to you a lot from the standpoint of emergency management because up until the 70s, emergency management was known as civil defense. Then in the 70s, it started to transition to emergency management. What we have found that over the last 20 years, really post 9-11, is that emergency management is still growing. It's still in its infancy, really. So <clears throat> when you start looking at how to be prepared for an event, you have to look from and it starts way before you get the job. It starts when you do the application. You want to look at that organization, see what their culture of preparedness is. And then that interview is as much for you as it is for them. You want to know how seriously they take preparedness. What are their goals for the organization? What are the goals for the community? When you're in that interview, you will be able to determine very quickly whether you're a proper fit within that organization. Now, once you get the job, Remember that leading during a crisis, you want to have a combination of emotional intelligence, critical thinking. You want to be able to lead those team members. But even before you get to the point where you're developing your team, you have to figure out who's on that team. What makes a good team member? Okay, is it those people that you only get along with or, and will agree with you, or do you want some of those naysayers on your team? So can you anticipate every crisis? Well, I will tell you this. You go to some organizations, Look at their preparedness plans. They're thousands of pages long. So they've done a good job of identifying every crisis, right? Wrong. They've identified what they think their crisis is going to be. You're not going to be able to plan for every single possible event. Okay? It's not the plan that we care about. It's the planning process. <clears throat> you want to make sure that you go through that 
planning process with all your key stakeholders, whether it's the faith-based, fire, EMS, schools, hospitals, non-governmental organizations, support agencies such as the American Red Cross, Samaritan's Purse, God's Pit Crew, some of these organizations that'll respond. You want to have those relationships prior to the event occurring. You don't want to meet somebody for the first time when that event happens. You want to have those in place so that you can pick up the phone and come and say, I need help. What causes chaos? Everybody know what chaos stands for? Anybody? Chaos. Chief has arrived on scene. Okay? Just keep that in the back of your mind. The chief has arrived on scene. Because usually when the chief shows up, he or she are usually 20, 30 minutes into the event when they show up, right? That's not who you want leading. You want those people that have been there since the start. Well, we talk about natural disasters, whether it be a forest fire, whether it be flooding events, tornadoes, hurricanes, but we also have mass gatherings. Anybody ever been to a college football game? Right. VMI has 5,000 in their games, right? That's considered a mass gathering. Okay? Go to an event to a college game. Go to Penn State where they have 60, 70, 80,000. Okay? Or to Virginia Tech. If you go to those events, what you don't see is all the behind the scenes. You don't see the snipers on the roof of the press box. You don't see those people in one room of the press box who are monitoring the weather, the traffic, the threats, okay? Anybody ever heard of Blue Ridge Rock Festival? Okay, I got a story for you, but not quite yet. So, <clears throat> to be an effective emergency manager, you want to be able to identify those potential risks. And you do that by doing a hazard vulnerability analysis. You want to have a comprehensive plan. You want to have your basic plan. You want to have all your hazard-specific annexes. Okay. And then you want to know who's going to do what. As I tell people, emergency management's not about who's in charge. It's about who's in charge of what. Emergency managers need to know everything. You need to know about preparedness. You need to know about response, mitigation, recovery. But you've got specialists within your organization that are going to help you get to that next level. You have to rely on your external partners. There is no locality in this country that can do it by themselves. Look at Hurricane Katrina. The hurricanes in... Florida, Deep Water Horizon, just last week, Lewistown, the mass shooting, 
That wasn't just Lewistown, that was the state of Maine along with the federal government, okay? So you're going to commit a lot of resources to an event. You have to know how to be able to manage those, okay? And who's going to be on your team to manage that? We can't talk about preparedness without talking about response. They're not mutually exclusive. Because your level of preparedness within your organization, the way you prepare your organization, the way you prepare your people that are going to be on your team, is a direct reflection of that response, whether it's going to go well or it's going to circle the toilet bowl, okay? I can tell you I've had more than one incident circle the toilet bowl. That's why I don't have just plan A, B, C, and D. I have plans out through double Z, okay? You're always, always adjusting. You try something, it doesn't work, you adjust. You evaluate it. If it's still not working, you adjust some more. Now, if you're going to be a successful leader, you need to have honesty and integrity. I'm preaching to the choir here. That's what we all live. Okay? Every day. You have to have communication skills. Every speaker so far has talked about communication. I will tell you this. In every incident that happens, every exercise we do, communication is the first thing that fails. Now, I'm not going to give you any textbook definition. This is just Robert Forsman's theory. You know why communication fails? Humans. Humans. We can have the best communication plan, but we each communicate differently. Okay? Just keep that in mind. Trust your team members. If they're good enough to be on your team, give them the power and authority to make decisions. Yes, there are things that as the incident commander or the emergency manager, you have to sign off on. But if you've put somebody on your team, let them do their job. Don't stand over them. Don't micromanage them. Be committed and have a passion. Is it a job or is it a career? I'll tell you something. Being an emergency manager is the same as being in the military. Okay? In the military, you are protecting the lives of your soldiers, right? Everybody agree with that? Okay. We're protecting the lives of our citizens. Okay. Now, why did I become an emergency manager? Well, I'll make this story short. I have three brothers. My dad said, and grew up in Lexington, other end of town, he said, you can go anywhere you want to college. 
I don't care. Said the only place I'm paying for is VMI. <laughs> Makes the application process really simple. Okay? But then he said something else to us. He said, whatever you do, you have to serve your country. Okay? I went to my dad, third class year. I said, Dad, I'm not going to be able to serve in the military. He said, find something you can do. Okay? My first class year, I joined the fire department. 25 years in the fire department. I retired, okay? I did that as a volunteer while I was teaching school, okay? Was I satisfied at that? No, because once you get that in your blood, you are committed and you have a passion for serving others. So if you have that, I would say go for it. Also, a good leader has confidence. Why did I put that picture up there? Have y'all ever seen a four-year-old running around in a Batman t-shirt? They are confident. They think they can conquer the world, don't they? I envision every one of you as a four-year-old in your Batman t-shirt running around your yard. You were invincible, weren't you? Don't lie. Tell me. You were invincible. All right. You want to make sure that you provide the vision for your organization. Direction for the program. You need to know where the program is and where you want to take it. But you can't take it there without that vision from the leaders of the organization. You want to make sure that you can coordinate activities during an incident. And have your own manage, uh, emergency management goals. We've talked about all these. You need to be able to communicate. Critical thinking skills. Decision making skills. Interpersonal skills. Leadership skills. We also talk about personality traits. Who do you want as your emergency manager? You want an extrovert or an introvert? Come on. This is two-way. When I ask the question, y'all need to respond. Extrovert. Why? Communication skills. Confidence. That's that four-year-old, right? I agree. Decisive. Now, does that mean an introvert can't be an emergency manager? No, not at all. It just means that they're going to have to move towards being very decisive, having that confidence. You want to be adaptable. Composure. You remain calm. You don't get flustered. Critical thinking. Decisive. Facilitation. Prioritization. Okay? And responsibility. Folks, I can't stress that one enough. Responsibility. The buck stops here. Absolutely, with you as an emergency manager, every decision you make, that's on you. Okay? Now, you may hear from your boss 
that it was the wrong decision. You may hear from the community it was the wrong decision. Right, wrong, or indifferent, that's the decision you made. <clears throat> and I always tell people, they say, why did you make that decision? I made it because it was based on the best information I had at the time. Okay? With COVID, we would make decisions at 10 o'clock in the morning. The information would change at 11 o'clock. By the time we got the information out the door at 2 o'clock, it was old and worthless. Okay? So we were behind the eight ball the entire time. And that wasn't anybody's fault. Okay? It was just the nature of the event. Most incidents that we deal with as a leader, you know that you get called, this incident happens, and it's going to be over in 8 hours, 24 hours, 72 hours, whatever. And then you go into the recovery phase, right? Start getting better. The problem is, COVID didn't act like that. For the first nine months of COVID, we had no control. All we could do is say, hey, wear your mask, disinfect this, do this, do that. And we watched people die. It was out of our control for nine months. Then we got the vaccines, then it started getting better, right? Look where we are today. It's still here, but it's not nearly what it was in 2020, okay? But own those decisions. We made a lot of decisions whether it was at the local health district, the state level, or the federal level, there were a lot of decisions made. I'm not going to say they were wrong. They were based on the best information we had at the time. Now looking back, okay, a lot of people are going to critique those decisions and say they were either good or bad? Does it change the outcome? No. No. When you're a first responder or in emergency management, whatever field, pick one, you have three goals, okay? You have three priorities. Life safety, protect as many lives as you can, stabilize the incident, and then property preservation. If you do those three things, your incident will get better. Let's focus on stabilizing the incident. It took us almost a year to stabilize COVID. Okay? That's unheard of. A house fire, you pull up to it, guys get off the fire truck, they pull the hose, they put the wet stuff on the red stuff, right? Fire goes out. You fix that problem in a couple hours if it's a big one, right? Okay? Somebody suffers cardiac arrest. Ambulance shows up. Little CPR, fly them to a hospital, and that incident's over in a couple hours, right? Except for 
the patient. It doesn't matter where you are in your career. Each one of you has a skill set. And that skill set is going to be valuable to your organization. And you are a leader. Okay? Whether it's an idea, a process, okay? start now. Start now refining your leadership skills. Okay? Remember earlier I talked about building relationships? Those are important because those relationships that you build now, not only from an emergency management standpoint, but it's who you know later on in your career that you can advance. So don't ever dismiss those relationships that you have. <clears throat> now, I've had a lot of experiences. Most people don't respond to one plane crash in their entire career. I've responded to three. Out of three pr plane crashes, I've had one survivor. The odds aren't very good if you crash when I'm around. Sorry for your luck. Um, the first one happened in the city of Lexington in 2000. Twin engine plane dropped out of the sky, hit the sidewalk over by Washington and Lee fraternity. Killed two. Second one I responded to, and that took a couple days. I'd been fire chief maybe a month and a half when that happened. Oh, and by the way, in between that time, 14 days after I became chief, I burned the most historic church in Lexington. Or at least that's what people say. I think I saved the most important church. It depends on your perspective. But it wasn't me. It was all those hundreds of firefighters. I just happened to be wearing the white hat that day. Okay? Okay? Second plane crash was in Rafine between here and Stanton. 2010, it killed four. Hit the ground at 600 plus miles an hour. Okay? I won't go into all the gory details, but one of my friends looked at me and said, what are you going to do? I said, we only have one thing we can do. And that is we have to work ourselves out of this. Okay? You notice what word I said? I said we. Okay? I didn't say anybody else. I'm not going to ask somebody to go do something I'm not willing to do. Okay? So I put gloves on, and we marched through that field and through the woods as the medical examiner took photographs. We marched through there and picked up body parts and put them in biohazard bags, okay? Nobody teaches you that in leadership school, okay? Nobody teaches you that it's dinner time and you can't take a break. 
They don't teach you that, hey, let's two of us work together. Make sure we take care of ourselves by eating. We've got the bio bags between us, picking them up, and hamburgers in the other hand, eating to make sure we got nutrition. Ain't nobody teaches you that. Nobody teaches you when you have to face a mom and dad and sister whose brother drowned on a Friday night. They don't teach you that on July 4th. You have to meet with the family and tell them their loved one's gone. There's no book for that. Folks, you just do it. You figure it out. Okay? There's no book for them. Nobody teaches you how to be a leader when you have to work from home for six months. Okay? You'll say, what's he talking about? March 2nd of 2020 was my first day on the job with the Roanoke City Health Department. March 3rd was our first meeting about COVID. Somebody said, oh, this will be over in six weeks. I drove home on May 15th, for those of you from VMI, good date to remember. Drove home, normal Friday. Got up Saturday morning, I said, hey, Robert, why don't you be smart and pick up the grass clippings in the yard? Which I did, until I got to the side yard. I collapsed in my side yard. And I died, was dead for three minutes in my yard. To a deputy sheriff who weighed 150 pounds threw me around like a sack of potatoes. Folks, if y'all can't tell, I have missed many meals in my life. Okay? Just a reference point here. I tell you this story because a couple things. One, I had loaded hundreds of people on a helicopter who'd been in accidents, been injured and stuff, and I said, I will never fly on a helicopter. Okay? Folks, don't ever say never. Because they put me in that helicopter, good thing they had good drugs, because I'm claustrophobic. If y'all have never been in a medical helicopter, there's very little space. Again, big guy here, not doing well. But because of those events, I had to work from home for six months. I was the emergency manager leading the COVID response. Leaders can't quit leading, okay? One thing that we tend to do as first responders is we put everybody else's welfare in front and let ours suffer, okay? So I've seen a lot, done a lot, could I have done a lot of it better? Sure I could. But like Chief said earlier, you learn more from your failures than you do your successes. Okay? So, who has a question? 
I don't think we have to get up and go to mics. Just if you got a question, just ask. Yes, sir. I think the biggest thing there is that you need to go out and build those relationships with your community wherever you're stationed. Go out and work through your chain of command. Explain the importance of emergency management because that's a huge resource. And make sure that you are able to build that relationship so you can start getting engaged on the ground floor with exercises and then moving up through the um, actual deployments. Yes, sir. Sir, I sat down the roof for a minute, but could you tell the Blue Ridge? Oh, no, I didn't. So, real quick, because I know we're running short on time, Blue Ridge Rock Festival. So Blue Ridge Rock Festival was held in Halifax County the week after Labor Day this year, okay? The promoter's name is Jonathan Sly. I'll leave that alone. They're expecting 45,000, okay? About 15,000? We're going to camp. So the health department has to give permits. Now, it wasn't my health department, but we were asked to go support it. Well, they go down there. They start letting people in on Tuesday. Now, if nobody knows where Halifax County is, you've got people coming from all over the U.S., and they're coming through the interstates of Virginia, interstates of North Carolina, just a huge mess. So on Tuesday, they started letting people in. Well, they had this huge plan. They were going to process cars at a rate of 480 an hour. Think about that. Pretty impressive, right? They had dogs, they were doing drug searches, weapon searches, confiscating all these weapons and drugs. They confiscated enough drugs to start a small pharmacy. All these people are going to a rock festival. So state police said, you got to clear the roads. They said, okay, so we're going to forego the security, we're going to let people come in. They're processing 2,000 cars an hour. What are they not searching for? Yeah, you guessed it. So this promoter said he had all his permits, he had all his contracts, was going to do all this, everything. Thursday rolls around, it goes fine till the thunderstorm hits at 6 o'clock. Tosses those pop-up tents, twist them like nobody's mother. Friday, things are fine. But you have to remember the crews that have been setting this up have been there for two weeks. They've been complaining because it's hot, very little water to drink, the food portions from the food vendor, very small, all of this. Well, I showed up Saturday morning. When I showed up Saturday morning, trash bags were piled up 10 deep around trash cans, had not been hauled away. Porta potties had not been pumped since Thursday night. They were overflowing. Okay? I get there and talking to everybody. I said, okay, what's the plan? 
we're talking plan, we get out on our UTV and we start driving around. It's like nothing's happening. It's very eerie quiet. So we find out at 3 o'clock that all the support staff had walked off the job. Okay, walked off the job. Project, project, pr production company had said, we're done. Okay, so now you've got 45,000 people in a venue with nothing to do and drugs and weapons. How do you think that's going to work out? Not real well. So to say the least, they canceled it, but there's a chance it's going to go back next year. The reason for the failures, they would not engage in the planning process. Halifax County just wanted the tax revenue, didn't want any responsibility. They didn't engage in the planning process. If you're an emergency manager, and somebody is going to hold an event in your county, hold their feet to the fire. Make them come to the table and be part of the planning process. If they don't, tell them thank you very much, go somewhere else and have your concert. Okay? Any other questions? I know we got about a minute. Maybe. 30 seconds. Nothing? Absolutely, thank you for allowing me to be here. It's been an honor and a privilege. <laughs>